right, looks like we, we have everybody here. We're going to get started. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Jennifer Walsh. I'm a senior media officer with the Institute of Medicine. And on behalf of the Institute of Medicine, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Those in the room and uh, those of you who are joining us via the web, uh, this is a discussion of our new report that was just released, Beyond Myalgic Encephal um, <laughs> Beyond and Myalgic Encephalomyelitis, uh, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, Redefining an Illness. And I'm sorry for butchering the name. Uh, this report is now available and it can be downloaded as a free PDF along with other related materials that go along with the report at www.iom.edu forward slash MECFS. This will be a one hour briefing unless we run out of questions beforehand. And we will start with some opening remarks on behalf of the committee members and some background on the report. And then I will open it up to questions. Those of you uh, who are in the room can ask questions as well as those of you via the web. And with that, let me introduce Rick Ertman, Director of, on the Board of the Health of Select Populations on the, uh, from the Institute of Medicine. Thank you. Oops. Again, I, again, I'd like to extend my welcome to all of you who are here today at the Keck Center, uh, and also those of you who are joining us uh, by the webcast. As you heard, my name is Rick Erdman. I'm one of the board directors here at the Institute of Medicine. Our board was honored to, to be responsible for the management of this particular report, which we are releasing today. And that report is entitled Beyond Myalgic Encephalomyelitis, Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, Redefining an Illness. Myalgic Encephalomyelitis Chronic Fatigue Syndrome is a mouthful and is commonly referred to to make it easier as MECFS. But it's a serious, complex, and debilitating condition that imposes a burden of illness on millions of Americans all over the United States and all over the world. The cause of MECFS is unknown and a diagnostic biomarker is yet to be identified and validated. Over the last several decades, numerous uh, and diverse case definitions and diagnostic criteria have emerged from a limited knowledge base, which has led to much confusion and contradiction about this disorder. So the Department of Health and Human Services, along with five other federal agencies, asked the Institute of Medicine to form a committee to define diagnostic criteria for MECFS based on current scientific evidence as well as clinical expertise, and also to propose a process for revalidation or re-evaluation of these criteria in the future, to develop an outreach strategy for dissemination of these criteria to health professionals all over the nation, and to consider whether a new name for this disease is warranted. This report today is the culmination of the committee's attempt to examine those questions. I am very pleased to introduce the committee chair, Dr. Ellen Wright Clayton, who is joined today by two fellow committee members who she will, will introduce. In a few moments, they will present the key findings and recommendations from their report. But I would like to take a moment to thank the, the entire committee for work on this very, very difficult task. Their efforts were also supported by an outstanding team of project staff led by Cece Mundaka Shah and included Kate Meck, Jonathan Schmelzer, Adriana Moya, and Sylvia Doja. Finally, I would like to thank our six sponsors, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the US Food and Drug Administration, the National Institutes of Health, and the Social Security Administration. We greatly appreciate their support for this work and for their ongoing commitment uh, to improving the lives of patients with, CF, with uh, MECFS. So I, now I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Clayton. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have to tell you that I am really excited to be able to share our findings with you um, after all this um, on this project. Uh, I want, these are the, uh, our committee members who um, all worked very hard, were very devoted to ensuring that this task was done um, with complete attention to the evidence base and to develop criteria that we would use going forward. I also want to point out that we had a very rigorous review of our report 
um, by a number of experts, many of whom you will recognize on this, um, on this process. This is an inherent part of the Institute of Medicine process, and so I want to thank them in particular. Well, um, here's an outline of my talk. Let me tell you that I'm probably going to be um, go through this relatively quickly because I want to have as much opportunity for conversation with you all as we can. I'm going to say a little bit about the background and context. Um, you've already heard a little bit about what our statement of task was. And then I'm going to talk about our key recommendations. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about pediatrics and comorbidities going forward. Um, the background is this. Um, this disorder is a complex multi-system disease that causes a great deal of disability um, and uh, de debilitation for millions of Americans. Um, we don't know the exact number because this disorder is radically underdiagnosed. Um, probably only 10% of those who actually have the disease are diagnosed. As you've heard, there have been multiple definitions over time. Um, and that diagnosing this disorder in the clinical context is a challenge. And that we know that patients often struggle for years before they get a diagnose, before they get a diagnosis. And that they often face a really frustrating process, as particularly as um, clinicians often dismiss their uh, concerns. Um, and so uh, this is really very important going forward. Um, and we know that it is burdensome and costly, both individually and socially, in terms of. Um, so let me go back a second. Um, uh, our committee was charged by a number of people who you've already heard. Um, these slides are all available on the web, so you can read them. But I just, um, but I want to get to the meat of this more quickly. Well, um, and here was our charge. Our charge was to develop evidence-based diagnostic criteria um, to address the needs of health providers, patients, and their caregivers, considering the various definitions um, and, um, and, looking at, uh, and looking at particular subgroups to the extent that we could do so. We were also, um, importantly, to pay uh, close attention to um, the concerns of patients and their advocates. We were to recommend whether new terminology would be adopted, and then importantly to recommend an outreach strategy, because I'll jump ahead here just a minute, and we think that this disease can and should be diagnosed by any clinician, not just the specialist in this disorder, but any clinician who takes care of patients ought to be able to diagnose this dis disorder. Um, this is our process. Um, we actually, you all know about the committee selection process. We had uh, five committee meetings with information gathering and two of them, uh, uh, hearing public testimony from uh, patients and caregivers um, and clinicians. We had uh, uh, lots of deliberation, drafting of report. Um, we then went through report review and approval, and now we are um, uh, releasing this report today. Uh, to give you a little bit more detail, we had five meetings with two public sessions. We got some input from the CDC multi-site clinical study of, MCS, in, um, of CFS. Uh, we did not have um, access to the information from the NIH P2P workshop. We had consultants. Um, and I would also emphasize, we got almost 1,000 comments from patient advocates and providers. We carefully reviewed each um, each uh, comment that we got from all of these, um, from all of these sources. So almost a thousand comments we went through and considered at great length. And then we conducted in a comprehensive literature review um, going back, um, as you can see, um, quite a while, back to 1950, looking at, uh, looking at uh, what's been known about this particular disorder. We built upon the work that has been done in the past. We built upon the definitions that have been used in the past, and we took all of that information into account. Our initial literature research turned up more than 9,000 articles, um, which is a lot of articles. Um, we then looked at the quality of the articles, as is typically the case um, uh, in literature reviews um, going forward. 
Um, and we did more targeted research on a number of major symptoms, including post-exertional malaise, orthostatic intolerance, neurocognitive symptoms, sleep-related, and symptom clusters, as well as many other, um, many other issues. We narrowed this down to, a, to actually a relatively small number of, um, of high-quality reports. And then in addition, patients sent us 1,291 articles, all of which we reviewed in depth and, and considered them and coming up with our criteria. So our key messages are this, that this is a serious, chronic, complex, multi-system disease that can often profoundly limit the health and activities of affected patients. This is not a figment of their imag imagination. This is not somaticizing. This is a common, uh, all too common, complex disease that needs to be diagnosed. And we concluded, based on our review of the literature, that a thorough history, physical examination, and targeted workup are necessary and typically sufficient to determine a differential diagnosis and make the diagnosis of, of this disorder. So um, our first recommendation um, is that this disorder should be diagnosed when the people meet, when individuals meet the criteria. Um, I'll say a little bit more about this in just a minute, but this is really important. We also think it's very important that there be a new ICD-10 code so that we're not stuck with benign uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis or neurasthenia or chronic fatigue. This needs its own diagnostic, diagnostic criteria, which will be helpful um, not only for these patients, but frankly, for the research enterprise going forward. Here are our criteria. Um, and this is the essence of this disorder, that there be a substantial reduction or impairment in, in ability to engage in pre-illness um, levels of occupational, educational, social, or personal activities. It has to persist for more than six months, be a com a com uh, accompanied by fatigue, and, um, and is not the result of excessive uh, exertion. Um, we also uh, require post-exertional malaise. I'll say a little bit more about that in just a minute, as well as unrefreshing sleep. It's interesting to note that there are no particular diagnostic criteria on sleep studies that are helpful in this area, but every patient complains about this. Um, and so we thought this was really important and that at least two of the following manifestations need to be, one of the two following manifestations needs to be required either cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. Um, how do we come up with this? The data and listening to what patients told us. These are, uh, these are symptoms that the overwhelming majority, and if not all of these patients have, many of them have objective manifestations that can be identified and that, um, and that these are absolutely essential to make this diagnosis. Um, we um, created an, um, a diagnostic algorithm um, that's also present in which uh, I'm not going to go into it detail, but basically it's just a, a, another way of representing what we already talked about. It's essential that clinicians assess severity and frequency. Um, these, these symptoms are persistent. They are severe. Um, they can come and go but they are something that people experience over a prolonged period of time. And that, and that it's important in order to make the diagnosis that these symptoms be present for six months because there are a number of uh, fatiguing disorders that actually resolve on their own within six months. Um, there are, I wanna back up here and make a point here that I know I'm gonna make later, but I wanna make it here. The fact that we have six months to make the diagnosis um, is important. But there is another important issue here. Patients who have these symptoms need to be treated, have to have their symptoms addressed, even if they haven't persisted yet for six months. So these patients have real symptoms. They deserve real care and real therapy, whether they meet the criteria for this disorder or not. So I just want to make that point absolutely essential. Um, there are a number of other manifestations that frequently appear with this disorder, 
Um, but they are not always present, and they often manifest in a variety of different ways. Their presence supports the diagnosis, but they are not required for the diagnosis, in no small part because they don't affect all these people. Um, I've already made this point that if people have symptoms, they need to be treated, whether they, um, whether they meet the diagnostic criteria yet or not. So uh, Dr. Bateman will say a word about what this is going to mean for clinicians. Is you. There we go. Good thing he's sitting next to me. We are hoping that these diagnostic criteria provide a very clear path for clinicians to make the diagnosis. Um, it's a fresh start. You'll be hearing about the descriptive name. Uh, the diagnostic criteria are evidence-based, which means they will be very convincing to physicians, and I think people will be able to start to see this illness. And we wanted to make sure that the symptoms that have been previously maybe overlooked by clinicians are put front and center in this diagnosis. I think it's going to make a big difference, not only for primary care, but also for specialists. Great. Thank you. Um, our second recommendation is that the Department of Health and Human Services develop a toolkit uh, appropriate for screening and diagnosing patients with this disorder. Um, uh, the current tools that are available are too complex um, and too difficult to use in a busy clinical practice. And I think it's pretty clear based on the evidence that it is possible to develop a more focused set of tools that can be used by any clinician to make this diagnosis. And when I say any clinician, I mean any clinician. I mean primary care, emergency medicine, all kinds of subspecialists. Any clinician ought to be able to make this diagnosis and that we think this is absolutely essential that this uh, occur. Um, we also recommended um, that we were asked to talk about reevaluation of these criteria. One of our points here is that the science is changing dramatically. Uh, we learned a lot from the data that already exists that allowed us to come up with these very clear um, diagnostic criteria. We expect and hope that more research in the near future is going to allow um, the refinement of this diagnosis, allow the development of tools that are effective for, um, you know, particular patients. Um, we're hearing a lot of talk about precision medicine. What precision medicine means in its, final, uh, in its final words is that we have tools that allow us to diagnose the specific disease in the individual and, de and devote specific therapy that addresses their needs. We are hopeful that this research will go forward. What that will mean is that we will need to reevaluate these criteria, and we um, want to ensure that this occurs in no less than five years, no more than five years. Uh, sorry, I said that wrong. Um, that this really needs to be done, and it needs to be planned for, because this is an area where the science is really changing, and we are you know, desperate that these patients get the benefit of the latest science. Um, Okay, here's the big one. Um, we, uh, as a group, spent a lot of time thinking about what we ought to do about the name, since we were asked to consider whether new terminology was, um, was needed. Um, and let me tell you what sort of drove this, besides the fact that we were asked. Um, it's clear that chronic fatigue syndrome does tremendous disservice to these patients. I mean, um, if I don't hear another person say to me, I'm chronically fatigued too, or that is this a real disease? It will be too soon. I mean, we gotta get over this one. Similarly, myalgic encephalomyelitis um, doesn't describe the essence of the disorder. Um, it is, uh, uh, and so, although I know many people advocated for it, it actually doesn't define, it doesn't apply to what we defined. So what we did decide to do was to focus on coming up with a name that addresses, identifies the major criteria for this disorder, which is post-exertional malaise. And for the, to that, but that doesn't say things to most people. So what we decided to call it was systemic exertion intolerance disease. The essence of this disorder is that if, if patients with this disorder um, engage in exertion, cognitive, emotional, 
physical, whatever, that their symptoms are made much worse and often for a prolonged period of time. That that is the essence of this disorder and we wanna name it for what it is. Now, the reason we picked this name is that there is a long history in medicine of coming up with names that define the central symptom. And they do that particularly when it's not clear exactly what the etiology is or what the subclasses are. So what we wanted to do was to make clear that we have a new definition which builds upon the definitions of the past, but which is distinct and which focuses on what is the central element of this disorder. So you can call it SEID. Um, I mean, that's what I call it. So, um, cause you don't wanna say that all those words, but the essence here is that we wanted to focus on what this disease is and say that it is that this is what these patients experience. And so that, that's the name. Um, now, Peter's gonna say a little bit about, uh, Dr. Rowe is gonna say a little bit about PEDS, and uh, then we'll wrap up here. Uh, thank you. The, um, as Dr. Clayton was mentioning, uh, the review of the literature on pediatric uh, MECFS or SEID uh, really, um, uh, emphasized uh, pretty wide prevalence. We think there are reasons for that, among them being the different case definitions that have been used uh, and the tendency of physicians to diagnose component parts. So, for example, the, the preference for something like postural tachycardia syndrome rather than MECFS. But in any event, it's a relatively common problem in pediatrics, also a complex multi-system condition uh, that can have profound effects on the social and educational uh, uh, development of, of adolescents and, and young children. Uh, it is one of the most common causes of prolonged school absence, uh, and uh, it is time to put to rest the notion that this represents either school phobia or school refusal. The, comment, the uh, point is that it isn't that these uh, young people don't want to go to school, it's that they can't. Uh, the pediatric evidence base was uh, much uh, uh, smaller than the adult evidence. And uh, while we had a number of papers, a reasonably good number of papers on autonomic manifestations and some on the cognitive problems, there were none on uh, using, for example, the two-day uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test as a way of documenting the pathophysiology. Uh, we had six papers that were very interesting to review on immunology, none of which addressed anything that the other papers were addressing. So we need a much bigger, liter a much bigger scientific base uh, to understand the illness in children uh, as well as adults. Uh, we concluded that there was sufficient evidence from the uh, scientific literature that orthostatic intolerance and autonomic dysfunction are common in pediatric MECFS, that the neurocognitive abnormalities, while not present at baseline when patients are tested in the supine position, they will emerge when, they are t when patients are tested under conditions of orthostatic stress, when they're brought upright, or if, if another uh, problem, another condition is uh, like distraction is introduced. Uh, there's clearly a high prevalence of profound fatigue, uh, unrefreshing sleep, and post-exertional exacerbation of symptoms, just as in the adult uh, papers. Uh, and uh, the evidence is strong that MECFS can follow acute infectious mononucleosis and EBV infection in a percentage. Uh, we tackled the issue of the duration of illness for pediatrics as we did for the adults. Uh, we felt that the illness was similar in, in uh, its overall um, uh, uh, symptoms, that we didn't need a specific pediatric definition, and we required a duration of six months in order to allow those patients who are improving after post-viral illness, uh, to uh, they, many of them will get better over the next few months few months before six months have elapsed. That will ensure that those who meet the criteria also have a more severe form of the illness. But uh, as has been emphasized by other pediatric groups, we wanted to be clear that these, uh, this six month duration criterion should not interfere with initiating advice, management, and care of the patients, uh, and that that can begin as soon as they enter the doctor's office. Uh, so that is a brief uh, summary of the pediatric findings.
Thank you. Um, I want to say a word about comorbidities, um, which is that uh, that past definitions have often said that if somebody, if a patient has something else, then they can't have this. Um, our conclusion is exactly the opposite. If they meet the criteria for this disorder, they have it. Um, and part of our thinking about this is that uh, many, many patients have more than one thing. And the idea that these patients, if they have something else, can't have this is just crazy. So, um, so our attitude about this is that if they meet the criteria, they have SEID. If they have something else, um, then that diagnosis ought to be made and it ought to be treated. But that it should not preclude a diagnosis of SEID unless the comorbid condition um, explains all the symptoms that the patient has. That is extremely unlikely. So the point that we want to make here is that it is incumbent on the clinician to make the diagnosis, to think about comorbidities because they are common, and if there are comorbidities, to diagnose them and treat them, but that their existence does not preclude the diagnosis of this disorder. So um, we think that's an incredibly important thing. These are, uh, we listed the comorbidities that have been um, identified in other definitions and didn't come up with our own, but we think this is a really essential issue. It is, it is possible to have this disease and something else. Um, areas that deserve further study, um, there is so much research that needs to be done. I mean, it's just astonishing. Lots more work needs to be done to study the etiology, pathophysiology, and effective treatment. Um, because of this paucity of evidence, we were unable to, divide, to uh, define subgroups or even to define the natural history of the disease because there really aren't good longitudinal studies for the most part. Um, there are some, but not enough. So more research is essential. Um, in terms of dissemination of the diagnostic criteria, the audience is just about everybody, to tell you the truth. Um, uh, we want to get to uh, key decision makers, obviously, including primary care providers. But frankly, any other hair care provider who is involved with the treatment of these patients, if they will just open up their eyes, they will realize that they are seeing these patients and they need to make the diagnosis and provide them with care. I mean, that is, you know, the bottom line. We also realize that um, there are other audiences as well. I mean, particularly in the case of kids, um, the K through 12 educators and college uh, health systems need to recognize this disorder, um, that they, that they need to, that we also um, are obviously speaking out to many other um, organizations in this uh, field. And then obviously we want to reach out to professional societies because they will have a major role to play in influencing the practice of their providers. And we came up with a lot of different things. You can read the report. Um, uh, obviously we want to thank all of our funders. Uh, we want to thank the speakers and the consultants and the reviewers um, who, uh, who I think were really devoted to making this the best possible project that product that it could be. Um, and, uh, and so, and, and we also wanted to thank the people involved in the FDA voice of the patient, because as you'll see, looking through the, um, looking through the report, we cited their work like crazy, um, as well as all the work that we got from the various comments from, um, uh, uh, from patients. I want to, I've also want to thank the staff, here are their names, um, and I think we're done. But I just, our goal here, we wanted to set out, we looked at the evidence. They drove our development of criteria. We think this is a diagnosis that should be made. We talked about how to make it. It is critically important, and that uh, and that we we think that's absolutely essential. Uh, there are lots of questions that we suggest to providers so that they can elicit the history that's important for this disease, so they can know to recognize that that's what they're seeing. 
Um, but, but the evidence, the scientific evidence, the evidence from the patients, the advocates, the clinicians was really clear. And so building on that and on the work of the many people who have been involved in treating this, discussion, this disorder for many years really drove our decision making. And, um, and it is our fervent hope that the result will help these patients. Thank you very much. And thank you. So now we will open it up to questions. So if, you, if you're in the room, uh, if you can go to my, a microphone on either side of the room to ask your question. And if you are asking a question via the web, there is a area to ask a question. Uh, type in your question underneath the video viewfinder and hit submit and we will receive that question. Uh, those of you who are asking a question in the room and on the web, I ask that you please identify yourself and your organization before asking a question. Uh, I'm Chris Williams, and I am vice chair of the board of the Solve MECFS initiative. Um, first of all, as a patient, I want to thank the committee. Um, I have been sick for six and a half years, and I'm, you know, this is the best thing that's happened to me uh, in that time. So I really want to thank everyone involved. Uh, prior to um, serving on the board, I uh, spent 30 years in the federal government working on health policy. Uh, half of that time on Capitol Hill, working for the Senate Majority Leader, and the other half at ARC. And at ARC, I was the Director of Communications, which uh, involved the dissemination of um, uh, information to physicians and other clinicians. And I just, I guess my big question to the committee is, where do we go from here? And um, how do you see this report being used um, by professional societies, uh, by HHS and other parts of the government, um, because I think this is a tremendous um, step forward and a tremendous um, platform to build on. So I, I'd really like to hear some of the ideas about how we move on from here. Well, I'll make a couple of comments. Um, one interesting comment is that JAMA and Annals of Internal Medicine have viewpoints today on this, you know, on this report. So that will be, um, I think that will be pretty high profile. Um, we certainly had the pleasure of briefing the sponsors of our report uh, about what their, uh, you know, about what we found, what we concluded. And I can honestly say that I think they heard what we had to say. No, clearly we're going to have to reach out to professional organizations. Clearly we're going to, you know, uh, you know, you know, clearly there's going to be work reaching out to organizations like yours and many others. Um, and, uh, and so there will, be, yeah, and, you know, and we have to do something about IC10, ICD-10. I think there are a number of things to do going forward, but we've really, um, I think this is a pretty bully pulpit for, uh, you know, for your, you know, for this disorder. And I'm, I'm hopeful it makes a big difference. Do you guys have anything to say? I just had um, one comment about the uh, fact that this is probably the most complete synthesis of the scientific evidence uh, that's been put together. And I think uh, one thing going forward will be that it'll uh, identify for uh, researchers and scientists gaps in the literature uh, uh, that uh, they can attend to and that will ultimately have some benefit for patients. We also think that at, at, the, at the level of a clinician, uh, this will be a much simpler, more streamlined process uh, that will help with people getting a diagnosis at an earlier point. Now, uh, how to make everything happen at the clinical end uh, was a little bit beyond our scope, but clearly there have to be many more efforts at uh, education so that physicians feel comfortable doing this. There are far too few specialists to handle the volume of patients who are affected. Change is not easy in any system, especially complex systems. But I think 
we have as about a good a foundation as we could possibly have to jumpstart this process. And then at some point, very soon, the work of this committee will be over. But I'd like Ellen to uh, maybe mention what resources will be available through the, the IOM uh, uh, educational materials. Um, and then it really is up to all of us to, uh, to get to work and uh, be supportive, work together, and see if we can get everybody on board so that we can use this as a very good foundation for going forward with research, funding, and everything this, uh, this uh, group of people need. So I want to give a shout out to um, our amazing staff um, who have already uh, created FAQs, um, who are in the process of creating a guide for um, a guide for clinicians that is going to be simplified to help them, you know, to help them implement this. Um, I think that it would be uh, very helpful to patients to, you know, be able to go to the web and get a download of what this is so they can take it to their doctor and say, you know, look, this is what I've got. And this is the IOM saying that this is what I've got. So you're right. I mean, the baton does pass from the Institute of Medicine now. But, uh, but we have tried to make that baton, passing that baton as smooth as it could possibly be. And I'd just like to emphasize that those materials are going to be available at www.iom.edu forward slash MECFS, uh, as well as today's slides that were used for the presentation. Uh, my name is Gregorio Mera. I'm a reporter for Televisa News Network from Mexico. And I would like to ask you, uh, if you know how many people have died or is impaired due to this uh, syndrome, also, if you know what uh, are the causes that trigger that uh, syndrome, and if you found a previous investigation, either here or someplace in the world, uh, with similar cases to these ones. Uh, well, I, I don't think we know how many have died. Um, maybe you all do, but I think we just don't have the data. Uh, I think that with regard to uh, with regard to the question of a resource like this, no study has ever been done like this. I mean, with this just extensive discussion of the data. I mean, so I think this is actually unparalleled. There have been many, um, you know, many, uh, you know, very thoughtful. Uh, discussions about what this disorder is, but uh, but none of them have had uh, have published quite the analysis of the you know of the literature that this one has. And do you have uh, any idea of what triggers that? Because we do understand sometimes is young people or uh, mature people. What what uh, what causes that? Well, first of all, that was beyond our statement of task. I think the only thing that we know with certainty is something that Dr. Rowe has already said, which is that EBV is a major trigger in children or in adolescents. But I think beyond that, there's so much work that needs to be done to sort of figure out what makes this happen. Lots of things have been claimed to make it happen, but at least from what we saw, the only solid evidence was about um, EBV. Thank you. And we'll go to the next question over here. Thank you. Uh, Robert Miller, 30-year uh, patient and advocate, um, in which I now have SEID. Um, based on what we have for experts in the field um, and the fact that this information is going to get disseminated to, you know, many more general practitioners, other doctors, specialists. Um, I would expect that there's going to be a huge influx of patients. And so how in the world are we going to be able to initiate research and catch up to be able to treat? Because there's no approved treatments for the illness. So. I know that there are representatives here from other federal agencies. Um, and so my question would be, how are they going to ramp up or gear up to be able to address treating, you know, whatever it's going to be, 50% more people or 80% more patients um, coming into, you know, right now, what are a handful of, of experts in the field?
Those are all really good questions. Um, the first thing I would like to say is that step number one is diagnosis. Um, and uh, I, as physicians and researchers become familiar with this illness, I think there will grow out of that a, a number of efforts to begin to identify treatments. We need a large group of people across all disciplines um, attending this. And I think that will naturally happen, um, but it's going to take some time. Second is I would like to say as a clinician that uh, specializes in this and related illnesses, there are many things that can be done to alleviate suffering and to treat symptoms, even some core symptoms, um, that can be very, very helpful. So there will need to be an effort made to continue um, getting this information out, uh, bringing other clinicians in to help, uh, help us with that. And of course, we hope there will be additional drug development as we understand the science. Just to follow up, do, do we know? I'm sorry, go ahead. Let me just add another point to uh, Cindy's comment, and that is that any physician should be able to treat some of the pain or headache components of the illness or the, the um, insomnia. Uh, the orthostatic intolerance treatments for those with SEID are no different than they would be for uh, somebody with a less complicated form of orthostatic intolerance. So there's a lot of information out there uh, and, and that will be linked to things uh, in the physician and clinician um, guide uh, on the IOM website. So I think that part of the need that you're mentioning will be addressed that way. Thank you. Um, in, in talking about um, the other federal health agencies, has there been communication between IOM and any of the federal health agencies on kind of uh, any initial discussion about ramping up research? Um, I, we certainly have shared with them what our results are, um, and we have been breathtakingly clear about the need for more research. Um, I guess what I would say, looking at it through the lens of history, now I'm speaking as my own person here, um, I think that with the, you know, with the, I think, very clear evidence of this disorder and its characteristics, uh, I think this gives advocates a tool, um, you know, to act up. How about that for a uh, the historical reference? Um, so um, I, you know, I say, so that's what I think. Go for it. I mean, I think we've given you the fodder. Okay, and one, one more thing, and that is um, I just would like to thank the IOM committee for, uh, for pu pulling this together relatively fast. Um, as a patient, um, I'm pretty confident um, that this will kind of ignite some excitement in, in this field and, and we'll get some researchers and hopefully some, some funding to go along with that. So thank you. Thank you. We have a question from the web, it looks like. Uh, this question comes from Gabby Klein. She asked, based on the evidence that the panel has found, will graded exercise therapy slash cognitive behavioral therapy as treatments be removed from the CDC's toolkit? Um, I'm happy to, well, I'm not, we actually, treatment was actually beyond the, um, was the scope, was beyond the scope of what we were asked to do. Um, so I, you know, so I really, can't say what CDC will do. Um, but I do, you know, there is the element of this disorder is that exertion exacerbates symptoms. So that's, I mean, that's an essential finding. So what they do with that is up to them. We'll go to a question over on this side of the room. Hello, my name is Anita Patton. I'm, um, I've had this illness for over 28 years. And um, I'm very, thankful for all the work that you put into this and what you have done in bringing forth a scientific um, diagnostic criteria to help the million people that I know have this illness. And um, another thing I'm wondering is, I've been on Amplogen for um, eight, over 18 years and uh, have had significant improvement from it. And most interestingly, um, 
an ability to tolerate exertion. <laughs> so I am advocating for the approval of Amplogen because it is the only thing in the pipeline, the only drug that is, is close or you know, within reason and it has been proven safe and, and it is quite effective and can be effective if they give it to the right person, I think, with the right broken lab system. Um, but do you have any advice for me as an advocate? Who can I talk to? What can I do to help for the approval of Amplogen? Or do you have any insight? I don't, I'm just asking because I'm totally naive. Do you have any ability to communicate or work with the FDA on giving them this information that you have to make that decision? Um, the only thing I can say is that FDA was one of our funders and they have the report. So... Um, I'll make sure they read it. <laughs> uh, I think they already have. So, uh, but in any event, yes, we, they are one of our funders. Thank you. I'm Mary Dimmick. I want to thank you for your work on this report. It shows, and I'm really grateful to you. One of the key issues that you raised is that there's been a dearth of research. Right now, we're using Facuda, Oxford, and Empirical, even as l lately as this month, to issue research findings. Have you said anything in your report or in your discussion with HHS about the need to replace those definitions with a new definition that reflects the way you've conceptualized the disease, not just rename those definitions to be SEID? Um, that was beyond our statement of task. Um, I mean, we, one of the things about IOM reports is that we get told what, we get told what our charge is and then we do our charge. And, and that we don't go beyond our charge. Um, so, uh, so, but I, uh, you know, but I think our work stands on its own. And I think it sends a very clear message. So, and we did discuss the various definitions as part of the report. And, and it's pretty clear that what we had in mind is different what, from what some of the other, you know, from what some of the other definitions are. So, um, as we say in the law, res ipsa loquitur, the thing see, speaks for itself. So I think our work, our work stands on its own. Take a question over here. My name is Wendy Shabazz, I'm a patient advocate. So I have a question. Why did you all not go with the consensus of the majority of experts in the field and adopt the CCC, which could have saved a million dollars? And why did you not use it as a basis for the definition? Did I say that too fast? Uh, so I think the answer to your question is that we took the, uh, the, the CCC definition very seriously into account. Um, and, uh, and I think that's important. There's been 10 years of science since that, since that was put out and it's been updated, but it, you know, but we, uh, we, uh, we accepted the charge that we were given and, uh, but we, I think pretty obviously paid a lot of attention to that definition. Right. Okay, um, one more question real quick. Let me just add a comment oh, about okay, that, sure. about the CCC uh, definition. You know, a lot of these um, uh, case definitions we've uh, clearly looked at carefully and tried to build upon the best elements of them. The difference between this and the CCC uh, definition, the initial one uh, especially, was this one was based on the evidence. Uh, it took into account many of the same things. Both reports emphasized the primacy of post-exertional malaise, of this inability to do, uh, to do normal activities, either cognitive or physical, without some sort of uh, payback. So we, uh, we built upon a, a very good foundation that was laid by the prior case reports. And so we're not being dismissive about them. We think that one of the limitations of some of the prior case reports or case definitions was that they were too complicated for the average clinician to use. They required several uh, symptoms from this column and several from that. This one is much simpler, much more streamlined, and for clinicians, we think it will ultimately make a huge difference for patients. So that will, in the end, uh, get more people cared for and treated, and that's no small feat. Gotcha. One last question. Are patients able to donate blood now because there was a concern about a possible retrovirus? Can you answer that? Yeah. 
that was a yes, huh? <laughs> I, as far as I know, uh, that has uh, not been an issue for a little while. Yes, patients can donate blood if they choose to. Okay, thank you. And do we have any more questions in the room or from the web? Actually, it looks like we have another one from the web. The question is, how, how will the information and findings from the committee um, be, how will you inform doctors of these new proposed changes? Well, we have made a number of suggestions to our funders about how to proceed with this. Um, in addition, as I've mentioned, we already have, uh, we have already uh, posted uh, fact sheets and other things on the internet um, that are downloadable for free. There will be a clinical guideline or clinical uh, guide soon that physicians can um, use uh, to make the diagnosis and obviously that patients can read. So it's, you know, so it's out there for sure. Um, and then as I mentioned today, uh, I am extremely pleased to say that both the Journal of the American Medical Association and the Annals of Internal Medicine published viewpoints today talking about this report. So um, I think that uh, I think that we have given some guidance about how to proceed, and uh, we are doing a lot of things to make this more, uh, you know, to make this information more clearly available. Cindy has something. I just want to emphasize that this report is accessible and readable. And everyone involved in this illness should get the report and take the time to read it. It's very rich, has many uh, references, also a plan of a recommended dissemination plan. Um, I think that it's going to uh, provide you with um, some very good reading and some reading you can pass on to others. Any more questions from the web? Yeah. One more question. Um, how are the common symptoms of immune and autonomic dysfunction addressed? Um, we discuss all the data about all the data that existed um, at the time we did the review. So the, yes, they are discussed. Um, so, uh, so I would just, I mean, that's a complex area, obviously, but they are discussed and um, and so I would just alert the, the, the questioner to look at that part of the study. I would add that uh, in the guide that the IOM staff are preparing, uh, there will be detailed uh, uh, questions that clinicians can ask to elicit information about uh, immune problems and especially orthostatic intolerance. Uh, if people are unfamiliar with how to take that history, that's in there. Uh, we list uh, questionnaires that can be used, and um, some of the common features that uh, go along with that condition, such as that the patient might not be able to remain upright uh, and seated during the time of the examination, might have to lie down, might look pale, might have a purplish discoloration of the limbs. So there are a variety of things that are both the physical findings to look for and the questions to ask to get at those problems. So we think this will help uh, improve the, the history taking that, that uh, people go through. Okay, well, it looks like we've run out of questions. So once again, thank you all for joining us here, those on the web. Uh, I'd also like to thank the committee members uh, who were here today. And I uh, just want to emphasize, I don't know if, if all of you know this, but the committee members who served on our committee, they served pro bono uh, to complete this report. And once again, uh, just a reminder, you can get all these materials, the report, uh, the slides from today, the materials that the committee members talked about at www.iom.edu forward slash MECFS. Thank you.